Okay, um, so uh, it's 4.03, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, um, my name is uh, Sergio Pino Oviedo. I am uh, the current president of the History of Pathology Society, and I'm also pathologist, thoracic pathologist and hematopathologist at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Um, this year, uh, as part of my, um, my term, uh, along with the other uh, officers of the society, we decided to create uh, this new uh, online midfall conference. Uh, just a few words about uh, what the history of pathology is in case you don't know about it. So it's a nonprofit organization comprised of individuals committed to the history of pathology and allied health fields. Uh, it was uh, conceived in 1994 by the famous Dr. Henry Azar and Christian Neseloff, who I'm sure lots of you probably even met in person. Uh, in 1996, in Washington, D.C., uh, there was the organizational meeting uh, took place where several international renowned pathologists got together to concrete this organization. And since 1997, the History of Pathology Society has been a companion society and um, uh, this year, um, uh, uh, we will have also a companion uh, meeting, which I will give some details at the end of the presentation. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce our first ever speaker to this conference, who is Dr. Frederick Askin. So Dr. Askin, uh, a little bit of information about him, even though he does not need, doesn't need an introduction. Well, he attended the University of Virginia for undergraduate. Uh, with a BA with distinction in English literature and his medical school in 1964. He spent uh, two years at John Hopkins in the private medical uh, service and then joined the US Navy as an epidemiologist at Naval Medical Research Unit 4. He then served on the Anatomic Pathology Service at Washington University in St. Louis as a resident chief, uh, as resident, chief resident and then surgical pathology fellow under Dr. Lauren Ackerman. Uh, he spent one year in a research laboratory at UC San Diego with Dr. Louis Gluck, who, uh, a neonatologist who promoted the use of the lecithin uh, sphingomelin ratio in amniotic fluid to determine look maturity. And another uh, year extra time with Dr. Uh, the famous Abel Libo, where he studied also pulmonary pathology. I'm sure lots of you people know who Dr. Libo uh, contributions to lung pathology were. Then Dr. Askin subsequently spent 10 years at WashU before uh, St. Louis taking a position of Director of Surgical Pathology at the University of North Carolina. Then after the death of Dr. Joe Eggleston, he became the Director of Surgical Pathology at John Hopkins in 1991. Um, and after 2007, he uh, went to the old uh, Baltimore City Hospital, which is now the Bayview Medical Center uh, and served there until 2019. Subsequently, he returned to UNC, where he is currently a, a clinical professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. His interests in pathology include adult and pediatric lung pathology, placental and benign uh, GYM pathology, uh, he, and he calls himself an amateur pediatric pathologist, and, and, and he presents his biweekly pediatric oncology conference, too. Uh, outside pathology, his interests include uh, spending time with his grandkids and he, the shows of dogs exhibiting and judging uh, professionally. So thank you very much, Dr. Askin. Uh, and without further ado, we look forward uh, to your lecture and I'm sure uh, we're gonna enjoy it a lot. Thank you everybody for being here. I will just request everybody to remain muted through the lecture. Thank you very much. Gracias, benditos a todos. Well, wait a minute. I think I better stop. I'm not going to do well in Spanish, but I gave it a try. So the the, the Askin tumor is an interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, I must say that uh, with the background, the private medical service no longer exists at Johns Hopkins. The Naval Medical Research Unit Number Four has been decommissioned, so there may be some unifying process here. It doesn't seem to have extended to Washington University, Hopkins, or pathology or here yet, but be careful. So this is the paper that started the the the, the whole saga of the so-called Askin tumor. 
uh, you can see it was published in 1979 with a, 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 a cast of thousands, including uh, Rosai, Dick Sibley at Stanford, Pepper Daner, and a radiolo pediatric radiologist, Dr. William McAllister. The concept evolved because Juan, who had perfect slide memory, as far as I can tell, realized I showed him a case of a thoracic lesion. And he said, you know, we have several more of these in the file. So my job was to go and look in the file and see what we can find. Dr. Rosai, Dr. Daner, McAllister, Dick Sibley, uh, who's still working at, San at Stanford, and me. The tumors look like this. They're called small round blue cell tumors. These slides are, are 40 years old and they are now small round pink cells, but uh, I have a couple more that actually do look sort of blue. Round, relatively uniform, not much necrosis, very little mitotic uh, activity. And it looked like Ewing sarcoma, but it wasn't in a bone. Why does anybody care? Well, at that time, Ewing sarcoma was simply a bone lesion. If it wasn't in a bone, it wasn't Ewing sarcoma. That's what the the the, uh, the statements were at that time. So I went to work and did some research using. Uh, and here, here's another. Sorry, here's another one that does actually seem to show sort of neuroectodermal uh, differentiation. There's one more. I couldn't find the slide. It, you could I could have presented it to you as an ependymoma with these uh, small round blue cells around a blood vessel. But that, was, that one was sort of unique. Again, notice clump chromatin, very little mitotic activity. So here is the research tool that I used to discover all the slides in our file. It manually operated and you pull these little drawers open and looked at the written, handwritten diagnoses by organ system. So I looked in the thorax, anything that could construe the thorax and found 20, at the end we found 20 cases that, that, that seemed to all represent the same entity. The features that we used in this paper probably don't make any sense but our our feature was and there, there's one this is important it was not ewing because it was not a primary bone lesion and we know that's not right now and it was they were glycogen negative so so much for special stains ewing's tumors were glycogen neg positive these were not they didn't involve multiple bones there was a female predominance and there were no light and dark cells. I'll show you that in a minute, components. We considered the possibility of it could be a lesion that Enzinger had just recently described at that time, which he calls soft tissue Ewing's. Not neuroblastoma. By EM, there were no new neurosecretory granules, and the location was obviously un unusual. Not rhabdomyosarcoma because uh, lack of cross striations no myxoid stroma, and nothing by uh, EM to indicate skeletal maturation, uh, differentiation in the tumors that we saw. We considered some other cases. Uh, Dr. Gordon Vauder, who some of you may remember, the very famous pediatric pathologist at Boston Children's, and uh, the first author on that paper was named Teft, T-E-F-T-T. -E they described a paravertebral round cell tumor that was probably the same thing, although I never could get Dr. Vauder to give me a definitive answer as to whether he thought they were or they were not. In the end, we found 20 cases. Uh, interestingly enough, 11 were actually in the chest wall. Five seemed to be plural based. One was found at autopsy in the left atrium, or right, I'm sorry, right atrium. One was paravertebral and two was entirely within the lung. So it's, you know, the majority of them were chest wall tumors, but they weren't all chest wall tumors, though thus the name thoracopulmonary small round tumor. Just for, for contrast, 
with what we were working at the, the time. I was for many years a primary reviewer for the Ewing sarcoma study for the pediatric oncology group and children's oncology group. This is uh, the paradigm of Ewing sarcoma. Small round blue cells, light cells, and dark cells. Here we are again. These are the same cell. They even look the same by EM. I, I'm not quite sure why. Some are dark and some are light, but this isn't a different cell type. Again, clump chromatin, no mitosis, very little micro, no, necrosis. So you can see why we you know, thought the main differential was Ewing sarcoma. So where did, where did the name Askin tumor come from? As far as I can tell, this is the fault of uh, blame goes to Dr. Timothy Trish, who's at the Children's Hospital of, of Los Angeles. Dr. Trish is a pediatric pathologist and a molecular person. He's also an excellent amateur photographer, by, by the way. Uh, very nice man. This is the first time I, I th this is the first instance of the use of the term Askin tumor to describe this lesion. So there have been multiple publications since then. Here, here, actually, here is his paper. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The Askin tumor is a distinct entity of greater significance to the radiology of the propensity for bone, bone marrow, and paraspinal area involvement. So they were, that's, that was their take on the, uh, on the lesion. Uh, I subsequently, after reviewing a lot of the papers in the literature, decided that actually, I'm not sure many of the people who quoted our paper actually read it. Many of the tumors that were described as Askin tumor were clearly a rose in ribs. In our description, the lesion could involve a rib, but the rib was not the primary, not the epicenter of the lesion. Rib involvement was, was a secondary phenomenon. So these things have been called a malignant tumor of the chest wall, which is certainly true, although they aren't all in the chest wall. Ewing sarcoma of the chest wall, that is probably true, but it wasn't what we said it was. Ewing peanut neoplasm of chest wall, that's probably more accurate. So just being from Baltimore, I like to quote the sage of Baltimore, H.L. Mencken, for every problem, there's a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. And that's a good standard to go by. So I have uh, subsequently the World Health Organization uh, raised, the, raised its uh, head and specifically, specifically this dissed me, <laughs> not recommended. Well, what they didn't recommend was the thing Ewing actually called Ewing sarcoma, which is diffuse endothelioma of bone. They don't recommend Askin tumor. They don't rec they, uh, and they or, or the term Ewing sarcoma arising in the chest wall, which is weird because the actual heading of this classification is Ewing sarcoma, primitive neuroectodermal tumor. So that's the World Health Organization. I think the Chinese probably share my puzzlement at the World Health Organization. However, Askin tumor persists in the literature. Online Mendelian inheritance uh, in man still says Askin tumor included and clearly describes Ewing's peanut family. And if you go uh, do a Google search, look at Medline Plus, uh, their take is Askin tumor is a type of peanut found in the chest, which is sort of vaguely true. I, I find that I'm luckier than Dr. Fritz Brenner, who described the Brenner tumor. He described the Brenner tumor in the ovary as U foroma folliculari in 1907, and he subsequently migrated to German Southwest Africa, which I believe now is Namibia. In, in 1910, 25 years later, someone walked into his office after he'd gone to South Johannesburg and said, hey, are you the guy that described the Brenner tumor? And that was the first he'd ever heard of it. So I'm a, a little bit ahead of him. By the way, this is a great, if you want to know something about people who have eponyms, 
have involved, go to this website. It's all it's all written as all one word. Who named it? Dictionary of Medical Eponyms. It's got some very interesting uh, uh, material in, in there. I, I, by the way, am not in it, so <laughs> there's there's no no uh, advantage to me. Just as an aside, here's an interesting fellow. This uh, Dr. James Ewing. Made the cut front cover of time here is outside of this house. This is a wonderful biography that I discovered while I was trying to 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 get my thoughts together about this uh, case. You, you, you can you, I don't know where you can find it. it's definitely online. If you look this up, the bi biographical memoir by James B. Murphy. Ewing was a fascinating guy. You think of him in terms of cancer, but his wife died of uh, eclampsia, and he became very interested in the pathology of uh, of eclampsia and and many other things. He's not a, a one trick pony. He, uh, this this book is actually very well for, worth reading. So, whatever happened to uh, Askin Tumor? Well, it got worked out. Uh, I, I don't know if I have this in chronological order or not. But it was discovered that if you did cytogenetics on these tumors, um, including Ewing sarcoma and other P peripheral neurectodermal tumors, they had a trans reciprocal translocation of chromosome 11 and 12. And then M immunochemistry became available. We, we did not have immunocytochemistry available to us in 1975. And then molecular patterns have uh, have been uh, described with the use fleet uh, one uh, 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 fusion. There are other fusions that uh, involve the EWS gene, and apparently current data don't really support any outcome difference based on yeah. current location when when patients are prospectively evaluated. So CD99 was the first thing that we uh, began to uh, to use. There's a, this is a very nice article about CD99, which I'm unfortunately becoming the next NSE. It now stains everything. It it involves many other lesions besides uh, Ewing's and and peanuts. Uh, it's, it's worth knowing about. Other immunocytochemical stains, NXK 2.2 is supposed to be more highly specific. And there is a flea one for that fusion nuclear stain that, that apparently works very well. Cytokeratin actually, it, it's described in, in diffuse adamantinoma type variant of viewings, but we saw cytokeratin positivity in a small number of just standard straightforward viewings when we were reviewing them in the, in the in the Ewing study. And then to periodic shaft shift uh, it raises its head again. However, I just want to warn you that not all Ewing sarcomas are PAS positive. Um, here's one of my dogs winning the Terry group at Westminster. This dog has subsequently gone to Thailand. This is one of my current dogs. Is the Boston New Gryffindor and a Scotty named Moxie. And I think I should have devoted more time to this, but that's what I've got. Can I answer any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Askin. That was a very nice uh, talk about uh, the asking tumor. I don't know if anybody has questions for Dr. Askin.